past time today and uh, what has been, I'm sure, been a very long day with multiple appearances for some of you. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you, who, in case there's anybody that's tuning in for the first time, to the USMA Class of 2006 War Studies Conference. Uh, this is going to be our concluding panel where we talk about how to uh, address and synthesize all the different threats facing the United States at this moment as we enter this new era of great power competition. Um, I also believe, I didn't quite realize this, this wasn't intentional, but I think that I, we've gotten a little bit of a reunion together for this panel. I think some of the panelists know each other, um, so I'm always happy to facil facilitate that. Um, for Again, for anybody who's new, just really briefly, um, a reminder that this meeting is being recorded, that the views that are being expressed are just those of the panelists and not those of the Military Academy, DOD, any other US government agency. Uh, and the last administrative note, if you do have a question, please use the hand raise feature, which should be somewhere to the left of your leave or hang up button. Um, if you if that's not working, then you can uh, type it out in the chat. But I know some people might have trouble accessing the chat box. Um, that said, I'm um, looking forward to an exciting conversation and I'm going to turn it over to the moderator, Colonel Pat Howell. Thanks, Max. Well, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Pat Howell. I am the director of the Modern War Institute at West Point, and I'll be moderating this last panel today uh, with our panel title being the Addressing Diverse Challenges. A quick little funny story on the value on how this panel came about, and it highlights the importance of uh, sort of walking and talking with your fellow scholars, scholars and peers. It's, it's amazing what idea will pop up. Uh, about nine or so months ago, I, was I ran into Tom Sherlock, who moderated our Russian panel, as we we're walking around the parade field at West Point. Somehow we end up talking about in Syria when uh, when a Russian mercenary force was end up being struck by American artillery fire. And Tom remarked, "Well, you know that was there's a big public public opinion backlash in Russia, but we didn't really capitalize on it." And, and that one that one thinking that one anecdote got me thinking on how. If we're going to try to use, you know, forcing things into the ends, ways, means, if we we're trying to consider how to change the ends or the ways of another country, what, what, what means or, or what risk could we, could we impose to make them sort of change uh, goals or, or methods? And so that's where we got the idea of how can we impose costs or create dilemmas on, on these, uh, on these peer, uh, peer and near peer competitors to, if not change their mind, at least maybe affect or ch uh, affect the way they, they behave. So this panel is going to be taking more of a strategic approach. We've had four panels already today. Each one dove was a deep dive into uh, the four big from four of the states from the uh, from our national security documents, um, and we purposely picked those those as panel topics. But we're going to take uh, we're sort of the wrap up the wrap up panel, um, and we're going to take a more holistic approach. And what I've done is I've sent out a list of questions to the uh, to our four panelists and. Uh, and they are either going to use some, none, or all of them as they craft their answers. So we're going to—it's going to be a, a magical mystery tour to see uh, see what topic, what questions spurred their thinking. So it's really—I'm uh, I'm really interested to see what our four panelists think. And I'm going to apologize to them in advance right now. I'm going to do a terrible job of introducing you. Uh, if I were to read their bios, one, it would one is incredibly impressive, and secondly, I'd probably spend most of our time just reading their bios on what they've done. So instead, I'm going to give a very short synopsis, and I apologize for for giving you short shrift to what is a very illustrious uh, career. All right, first off, in alphabetical order is uh, Colonel and Doctor Stephanie Ahern. Uh, she is the director of concepts at the Army's Features Command. Uh, when she was serving, serving the National Security Council a few years ago, she was one of the four authors of the 2017 National Security Strategy. Second up is Dr. Emmer Ashford. Uh, she's a senior fellow with the New American Engagement Initiative in the Scowcroft Center for Strategy, Strategy and Security. She's also been a research fellow in Defense and Foreign Policy at the Cato Institute. Third up is Dr. Michael Horowitz. He is currently the director of the Perry World House and Richard Perry Professor at the University of Pennsylvania. In 2017, he was awarded the Carl Deutsch Award by the International Studies Association for his early career contributions in the field of IR and peace research. And last but not least is Dr. Nadia Shadlow. She is currently the senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and a visiting and a senior visiting fellow at MITRE. She has previously previously served as the U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategy. And she was also the primary author for the 2017 NSS, 
So we have a theme here. We have two writers in one location. There might be a question later on about that. Now, with that in mind, uh, just because it is a topsy-turvy time with the election, I introduced you in alphabetical order, but we're going to do comments in reverse out of alphabetical order just to shake things up. So, uh, Nadia, I'll head over to you. Uh, the goal is 10 minutes, um, and at 10 minutes, I might send you a firmly worded demarch in the, in the message box, but I think we'll be okay. Yeah, I definitely won't. I won't be 10 minutes. Um, so I'll. I'll I took the mandate of, of putting out some general thoughts uh, furiously. And it's definitely not the primary author because Stephanie Ahern, who's on this call, was another key, key author. So I often say architect, architect. There were lots of people contributing to the national security strategy, including, including Stephanie. Um, so today, I, you know, it's the end of a long day for everyone. Um, and thanks for sticking, sticking with us. Um, I think today was also somewhat of a depressing day, no matter how you feel about uh, what's happening in our country, the internal uncertainties. It was also a day of discussions about threats and challenges, right? Challenges posed by Iran, North Korea, Russia, China. So in some ways, you know, our panel's the easy part. We're just going to help think about how to solve all these problems, especially Mike Horowitz. But before he does, I'll offer a few thoughts to just sort of uh, set out why I think a great power competition framework continues and should continue to offer a solid way of thinking about these threats. It's not the only framework, right? The only approach, right? The United States of America needs to adopt different approaches for different circumstances. We are going to have to deal with non-state actors in various degrees, but it does offer an important framing, I, I think, for some of these strategic problems. And why? For three reasons. First, states are at the core of the international system. So it reminds us of that. It reminds us that states are the ones that have the power and the resources. There are no amorphous transnational forces. There are states that drive developments and events. States fund military forces, states fund economic aid, states emit carbon emissions. Second, great power competition is important because it will determine how we live domestically and internationally, because those states that have power and those states that have influence have the ability to set the rules of the road. So it's about who determines those rules, who polices them, and we, we will be influenced and impacted by those rules of the road. And third, great power competition involves the ability to use a diverse set of, of statecraft tools simultaneously and continuously at all levels to great effect. So I think those are three core features of the international system that will continue um, term is, is, is not used or grows out of fashion. Um, and the concept was resurrected essentially because the United States had been on what I sometimes call a holiday from history for decades. Uh, we were under four assumptions during the post-Cold War period, which proved to be false or weaker than we had hoped. The first assumption that states were converging toward liberalism. But we found that unfortunately, some states such as Russia, China, Iran were not. Their, governance, uh, their governments did not have the intention of converging with the West. Um, our hope that China's joining of the World Trade Organization would somehow liberalize, I mean, to a certain degree, I'm not uh, you know, liberalize the country or make it a part of the, the rules-based international order did not really pan out. Instead, they manipulated those rules to their benefit. Another assumption was that economic globalization would lift all boats. But in reality, there were winners and there were losers. It had increased interdependencies and vulnerabilities. COVID brought this to the fore for the broader public, uh, but I think national security experts had been worried about that for some time. Third, related to these first two assumptions, we put a lot of faith in international multilateral institutions, but in reality, they had a limited capacity to transform the behavior and preferences of states. In addition, many of them suffered from a very broad mission creep, which increased the bureaucracies associated with these institutions, which in turn takes a toll on their capacity to actually deliver on outcomes. So, for instance, by 2000, the World Health Organization, which had initially been created to focus on pandemics and fast spreading diseases, had begun to issue warnings on everything from food safety to cellular phone usage to air quality. 
And you see this kind of mission creep in many, many other organizations. And why does it matter? Because if they can't produce outcomes, I think it increases the cynicism of, of people um, that they're supposed to serve or that they're, they're, um, that they were created to help. And fourth, our hope was that technology would empower democracies. The age of information would become the age of liberation. Liberty would spread by cell phone and cable modem. Those were two quotes by two different presidents, one Republican, one Democrat. But it came into question more and more as countries are using digital technologies uh, to, to surveil, to control their populations. And I think it's fair to say now, uh, the prevailing view is that these technologies favor authoritarians. So by calling into question some of these key assumptions doesn't mean that we should see only the negatives. Uh, I don't wanna be painted as sort of a dire, cold-hearted realist <laughs> that doesn't hope for the best. But I think that by understanding the forces at play, we actually have a better chance of shaping a world which favors free and open societies. We have a better chance of seeing the opportunities to affect real change. So doubling down on what we've done in the past, in my view, is damaging since I think we're unlikely to make real progress on solving real problems. We need to take stock of the competitions underway, study them, look at points of leverage and asymmetric advantages within them. And this audience, I think, is especially well suited to that, where those who study war and national security and the nature and character of war understand what asymmetries are all about, what leverage is about. So as I close, um, I'll urge you to consider the dialectic at play today, which is interesting. I didn't coordinate with Colonel Howell, but his point very much in the introduction about opportunities that we often miss. The study of war is filled with the continuous interaction of opposites, certainty versus uncertainty, centralization, decentralization, mass versus dispersion, you and the enemy, offense and defense. And in this case today, it's not just threats, but it's also opportunities. Um, so any plan to address a challenge or threat that ignores that dialectic, the opportunities will be incomplete. So I think we have a real opportunity today um, to use the findings of this conference and all of the great knowledge here that we've seen all day uh, to think through some of the opportunities going forward, uh, no matter who ends up in the Oval Office in January. So thanks very much. Over. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, wow, I was very impressed. Seven minutes, so you are you're you're giving back time, a, a a a feature you don't see too often in conferences, but it is appreciated. I did appreciate really in, in your talk, and uh, I am I am personally a strategic planner, and when I'm scanning the the list of people who are attending, that so there's a few folks on board who I know are also strat planners, and uh, I'm very glad that you hit the you, you hit on the four assumptions that have turned out to be wrong, and it, it makes me think of the old adage. You know, what do you do when you uh, when your facts and assumptions change? You you might want to change your plan. So you you nailed those four assumptions that drove uh, foreign policy for a while. And if those assumptions are wrong, it might be time for us to recock and and rethink what uh what, how we go forward. Uh, so with that, I'm going to head over to Mike Horowitz. You got it next. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for having me here and uh, thanks as always to Nadia for taking uh, all of the good things to say and and so I, I don't really know what I'm gonna do now uh, I'll, I'll just claim that you know I was gonna say lots of smart things but she stole them all uh, and and thanks as well to the to the modern war Institute uh, and especially to Max um, who uh, as many of you may know uh, was a uh, received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and has always been amazing to work with and I'm always really grateful for the the opportunity to be on this panel and with, uh, with, with new friends like Emma uh, and people I actually know uh, pretty well, uh, Nadia uh, and Stephanie, uh, both, uh, sorry, Colonel Ahern, both of whom uh, I've worked with uh, before, and it's a real uh, honor to, uh, to be here with uh, all of you. Uh, I actually wanna start in, in a place where uh, I, I suspect that Nadia and I completely agree, which is the importance of great power competition. And, and I would expect to see this feature prominently in the future of American foreign policy regardless of who wins the election, although the label may change if Biden wins. And that, you know, given that we know that presidential administrations uh, often, um, you know, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, why don't we say repackage ideas, uh, even if, uh, even when not necessarily changing those policies, it's something uh, Emma may talk about in her remarks, it's something she doesn't like. Uh, in that if you, if one wishes for a more radical changes in American uh, strategy or foreign policy, then, then some of this repackaging might be seen as a negative. 
but you know, to the extent that that states, for the reasons that Nadia outlined, and specifically states like China, especially, but also Russia, represent enormous strategic challenges for the United States. Then, you know, great power competition is here to stay, even in a world of climate change uh, and uh, pandemics. And and in reality, I, I think you know we too often have this conversation of, as one of you know should we compete or should we cooperate. When the answer is that competition and cooperation always happen simultaneously, they did even in the Cold War. The question is the balance between them and having reasonable expectations for what cooperation will look like or what you can benefit from, as well as reasonable expectations for what you're going to get out of competition. And I think a challenge for the United States right now is that the real threats are a mix of interstate threats and and what I call transnational threats. You, You both have your state threats, sort of Russia and China as well as as threats that, to, to Nadia's point about CO2 emissions coming from countries, emanate from states, but where the strategies for addressing them are harder to do on a state-by-state basis. And that's dealing with things like pandemics, uh, dealing with things like uh, like climate change. And, and I realize that we're, you know, sort of at, uh, at West Point, but, you know, it's not that surprising in some ways that the, you know, the in, one of the institutions in the U.S. government that's traditionally been most on top of the national security challenges posed by climate change of the United States Navy, which is thinking about basing and in, in sea level rise and you know, all, all sorts of very practical implications uh, to climate change and how it could affect America's ability to project power uh, and, and American strategy. So that'd be thing number one. A great power competition isn't going anywhere, regardless of who wins. I'd say second is that I think in some ways, uh, let me put on my academic hat for a minute. If you wanted, you know, something of the like best uh, natural experiment you could get uh, where you where policy maybe doesn't change as much as people think it might, but you you swap a lot of a, a dramatic difference in rhetoric. Uh, imagine a shift from Trump to Biden where you you don't have tweets um, or <laughs> you have tweets very rarely, um, but the U.S. continues to compete with China. In a very in a very similar way, it, you know, to the in, in when I say academic hat, I mean, you know, if you to the extent one believes sort of, you know, what one would call sort of constructivist ish arguments about the way that about the importance of rhetoric and the way that you frame issues, pra- not not changing anybody's national interest, but at the margin changing incentives to cooperate uh, or to defect, then we might be running that experiment in some cases. Look, in some cases, Biden, if he wins, might be different. But in many cases, I think that he, he will not be uh, maybe as different as, uh, as some uh, that more in the restraint camp would want. Um, or, you know, then, then maybe some uh, uh, in, the, in the Trump camp would, uh, would admit. But I think to deal with the, these challenges, I, I think it would be remiss in a world where, you know, uh, over 200,000 Americans have died uh, of COVID, and where uh, the United States has uh, some crushing economic uh, issues, that the U.S. has to get its own house in order to, to confront these challenges. You know, a divided house is not going to be strong enough to handle the rise of China, I think, in particular, let alone, you know, whatever challenges Russia is throwing at us, the transnational threats like pandemics and, and climate change, Iran, uh, et cetera. America is a deeply flawed but mighty and incredible nation. But if we can't get our act together uh, on education, on uh, on our economy, on uh, reducing inequality and giving more people a stake in uh, in outcomes and in, in feeling like they have a chance to succeed in in the in American society where all of us on here in some ways are, are are winners in that, then there are a lot of challenges there. And part of, I think, the future of American strategy is going to be the U.S. getting its own house uh, in order. So if point number one is great power competition is here to stay, point number two is perhaps even if Biden wins, we won't get quite as much change, although a lot of change in rhetoric. And the U.S. certainly needs to get its house in order. I would say the third thing is, how should we be looking forward when it comes to planning uh, for the future? And uh, one thing I would kind of make a pitch for, and I realize this is like slightly narrower than what the, the focus of the panel on, so I suspect we, it, we might be unlikely to return to this in questions, is a, a thinking of more seriously about what systems for forecasting geopolitical change and, and geopolitical consistency might look like. And that the U.S. made some initial progress in designing uh, both sort of classified and unclassified systems for aggregating the wisdom of crowds, you know, using prediction markets, using 
sort of cutting edge behavioral science to try to to try to understand better, say, if you know, if a national intelligence estimate every five years says there's some threat of a pandemic, well, how, how, what does that actually mean? How big is that threat? If we knew that, it might be then easier to figure out how should we allocate resources against said threat. That you know, what what the last year in particular, but I think the last four years have it brought home is the importance of a more systematic and serious approach to not just strategic planning in some ways in a, in a, like a J, uh, like a J uh, seven kind of way, J five kind of way. Um, but, uh, more broadly in, in, in geopolitical forecasting to try to understand how the character of the security environment might be changing in the shorter term, uh, and in the long term. And I think there are some behavioral science tools that frankly, as a country, we should be, we, we started to invest in and could do more in. Fourth point I would make is that we we need to understand that the world has probably changed and that there are going to be trade-offs. That, you know, we we really like, look, it benefited us. Like when I when I went to college, the I'm a, I'm a child of the 90s. And when I went to college, you know, when we thought about America, you know, America could just sail an aircraft carrier through the Taiwan Strait. Not a big deal. And when we thought about what fighting and winning a war would look like, we thought about it like, all right, it's going to be like a, a, a 60 to three football game. That doesn't mean that the U.S. can't fight and win the nation's wars. Many of you would be on the front lines of those conflicts. And, and, and I think you know, I'm incredibly grateful for your service. But those conflicts, even if America is going to emerge victorious, are going to be maybe a little bit closer than some of the conflicts of the past, which means we need to plan differently. We can't plan, essentially, to you know, win 60 to 3 when really we're going to win like 40 to 25. A different kind of game plan for that, different con ops, different doctrine, and especially, I think it changes the risk calculation. And here's where I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. And it changes the risk calculation in this way. When you have the best military in the world and the best trained people in the world, every day, it's easy to look at changes in doctrine, in con ops, and in the integration of emerging technologies like robotics, uh, AI, et cetera, as, uh, as a little bit too risky. Because presumption is that we should stick with what we have because what we have works. But if faced with a changing security environment where adversaries are getting increasingly capable, that in some ways to me means that the U.S. needs to be willing to take a little bit more risk in thinking about force structure to develop the capabilities necessary to fight and win the wars of the future. And I'd, and I'd conclude by saying that also, I think, will require greater cooperation with allies and partners, and this specifically when it comes to technological leadership. And that given the special challenge that China is posing from a technology leadership perspective, I think it's going to be critical for American strategy for the U.S. to be able to work more effectively with other free societies around the world on everything from things like AI and robotics to things like advanced semiconductor production to try to maintain in some ways, as we did in the Cold War, a, uh, a group of like-minded countries that can work together to ensure that, that, that we have technological leadership, since that's not only, that doesn't, that doesn't only feed into our military, even though we know that it, it's how organizations change that actually really matters for producing power. It's also critical for future economic growth in the future economy, which is the long-term backbone of power. Uh, and with that, I, I will stop, uh, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Hey, thanks, Mike. Hey, Pat here. Quick, three, three quick comments for you then we'll, before we hand over to the next. Uh, one's humorous, one's scholastic, and one sort of gloomy. The humorous one talking about just renaming things because the administration changes. I've been on a I was interagency planning team that was in the, that just merely was taking uh, PPDs by uh, by President Obama and making it an NSPM under under uh, President Trump. So I'm sure if that changes, uh, there'll be another one of those uh, funny exercises. The scholastic one is very uh, very ironic or very serendipitous that you talked about forecasting. Uh, the foreign affairs copy I just received yesterday, the lead articles by George Tetlock about forecasting. Uh, so serendipitous that you mentioned it. And on the gloomy side, uh, you highlighted a point that, uh, you know, we could be a victim of our success if we're, if we're successful, if we're as good as we are, we are very risk averse to doing those revolutionary or evolutionary changes that we need to do. And unfortunately, the only time we, we tend to learn, learn that is when we get a punch in the nose. And so hopefully by a forum like this, where we can think through the problems, we can avoid the punch in the nose that causes us to change. All right, with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Emma, over to you. 
Great, thanks. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to be here and, and frankly for letting me crash this uh, reunion because I, I actually don't know most of the panelists and I believe you're all already friends. Um, so I'm here to tell you why I guess everything you've heard all day today is wrong. Um, maybe not maybe not quite everything. Um, but I, I wanted to start by challenging some of the assumptions in the way that this um, this forum and this conference was actually set up. Um, and I really appreciated Nadia starting out by um, outlining, you know, why she thinks the sort of post Cold War consensus in US foreign policy was was problematic. And I honestly could not agree more with her um, sort of diagnosis of what went wrong in the 90s and the 2000s in US foreign policy. Um, but where I think we differ is in what that means for US foreign policy going forward. Um, and so um, I, I basically want to break down the title of this conference and talk about why I think maybe we're looking at this through the wrong lens. So the title is Coercion and Competition, How the US Can Impose Costs and Disrupt Adversaries Without Resorting to War. And then we've had the four panels, one on Iran, one on North Korea, one on Russia, one on China, um, all of which the US is, is confronting. Um, so first point, the framing of this is wrong. Coercion is ineffective in many cases. Um, and my sort of read of the previous panels is that we've actually seen this in discussions of specific cases throughout the day. The US is increasingly relying on coercion as a tool, um, whether it's the use of military deployments, military strikes, whether it's the use of economic sanctions. We are very reliant on tools that are about forcing the outcome we want. Um, and what we've seen in situations ranging from the maximum pressure campaign on Iran to trying to deal with North Korea's nuclear program um, is that coercion and maximalist demands have been very uh, unsuccessful in recent years. And so for that reason, I'm doubtful that doubling down on coercion as the primary way that we approach these problems is, is going to actually lead to a better outcome. Second point about the frame, the states that have been discussed over the course of the day um, are an odd group. And, uh, you know, I know we have a couple of authors of the 2017 National Security Strategy here. Um, when these states were included in that en masse, it was a rather strange grouping. Um, these states are wildly different. They have wildly different implications and different threat levels for US foreign policy. We've got a, a state in Iran that is a relatively militarily weak state. Uh, you know, it has asymmetric capabilities, but it's not threatening um, the US outside of its region. It doesn't have a nuclear capability yet. Then we've got North Korea with a minimal ability to deter uh, the US because of its nuclear capabilities. Then we've got Russia, declining great power, very good at sort of meddling, uh, perhaps not head on, but you know, very, very good at, at disrupting what the US is doing. And then we have China, rising great power. The fundamentally different states. Um, and I think that in grouping them together and asking what the US response to these threats should be um, is going to sort of encourage us to think as if they are very similar threats. Um, and I think more broadly in US foreign policy, we have this problem where we tend to bracket states into two buckets. They're either allies or they're adversaries. And there, there is a world of states out there that don't fit into those two buckets. So a third point, um, the frame is wrong because it's talking about competition. Um, and I think I really like the way that, that Nadia framed this early on as, as great power competition as a frame for thinking about how we deal with the world. Um, but that's not how it pops up a lot of the time in the discourse. Um, what it pops up as is our goal is to compete, to compete effectively. Um, that's not a goal. That's a, that's a means, right? We are competing with other states. Why are we competing with them? It's not clear. So there are a number of answers out there, um, but it's not clear which one we're actually pursuing. I'll give you a few options, right? We could be trying to maintain our military quantitative and qualitative edge. We could be trying to maintain US hegemony in all key regions of the world. We could be trying to succeed in uh, ideological change, making the whole world look like us. We could be trying to protect US allies or protect just the US homeland. And you could see these are wildly different, right? So to ask what we need to do in order to compete, that's a tautology because competition is not an end. 
um, and to ask how we impose costs on other states without any sense of why we're seeking to impose those costs is fundamentally unstrategic. A fourth point, I think we're making a mistake in assuming that each of these is an adversarial relationship. Now, nobody says that we're going to be friends with Iran or North Korea or Russia tomorrow. That's ridiculous. Um, but the assumption is in many cases that the threat from these states could not be diminished, um, that there is nothing we can do to negotiate, to try and prevent further developments in North Korean missile technology, that we couldn't seek to return to the JCPOA or negotiate with Iran on, on other regional security issues, um, that we can't find a way to ratchet down tensions with Russia. And so again, I think this, the confrontation frame is problematic because it makes the assumption that this is an unchanging and adversarial relationship. And then the fifth problem that I would highlight is the, the, the phrase on the end is without resorting to war. And I think this is backwards for the same problem as great power competition. It basically argues that war is a means, whereas I would argue that not going to war should in fact be a goal. Um, if we are going to treat war as a means, then we need to be clear about what it is that we're actually trying to achieve. And to be clear, if you look at the discussions that we've had all day today on all of these different uh, cases, all of these different scenarios, there are no good military options for achieving concrete outcomes in any of these cases. So obviously this is the Modern War Institute, this is a conference on the future of war, but I think again, framing it as without resorting to war really mixes up our ends and means. Um, so before I annoy the rest of the panelists anymore, I'm going to wrap up. Um, but I think that the, the key point to, to take away from this is that great power competition isn't a goal or isn't it isn't an end. Um, we can't choose the means with which we are going to compete with other states until we figure out what competition actually means. Um, and for me, I would say that our end should be maintaining the security of the U.S. homeland, protecting prosperity, protecting our way of life, um, and that perhaps this needs us to think a lot more about tools that aren't coercive um, and how we might approach the world using those. All right. Well, wow. Two two speakers on one panel have uh, have returned time. This is uh, probably unheard of. Emma, thank you for your comments. There's a uh, Nothing. There's a phrase "go big or go go home," and, and you know, with an opening line of "everything's wrong so far" is a quite the bold statement. And my hat is off to you. And no, and on a more serious note, thank you for uh, uh, always going after looking at the foundational assumptions of an argument is, is good. And I like the way you you went through the way we've uh, we we've, we constructed the conference. All right, with that, I'm going to head over to Stephanie Ahern for uh, the fourth speaker. Over to you, Steph. Thank you so much, Pat. And um, and it just it really is an honor to be a part of this discussion. Um, I, I take great pride in the fact that uh, my crowning achievement is working for Nadia when she was the deputy national security advisor. Um, so you know, and being able to to work with you all. Um, uh, so, but I also I really want to thank the, uh, the MWI and the panels throughout the day to to really engage in these topics. One of the most humbling experiences I ever had was going to grad school. I had just finished company command and I'd taken my company in January of 02 to Afghanistan and then to uh, to Iraq during the invasion in 2003. And when I got to grad school, there was a book by uh, Lenson Stepan that was about the problems of democratic transition um, consolidation. And in the back, it had a checklist is that if you had an authoritarian government and you toppled the, the leader, what would happen? I was like, this is humbling. Um, and it's not like if the leaders at the time had that book, they would have known what to do. But but it really what it showed me is how much uh, uh, just expertise and experience exists in so many parts of our country. Um, and if we're going to be successful, we've got to have as many voices, um, even if it makes us uncomfortable and it makes us think through things differently. Um, because we need translators, we need people that are able to connect the dots, and we also need great Americans like. Uh, some of you on this panel who have spent time serving in government to help make things better um, and then criti uh, critically poking at government to make sure that we're doing what's best for our country. Um, so going to be coming at this from a practitioner perspective and how can we use these ideas and um, because I'm being charged for developing the Army's future concept for 2035. 
Um, but I do want to say that at the military's core, it is never our interest to resort to war um, because these are our colleagues that are hurt most. Um, but that said, you know, pulling on one of the great uh, military strategies of Clausewitz is that the enemy gets a vote. Pulling on a different military strategist or political strategist probably is the right term, is that Sun Tzu is that you can also win without fighting. And I think as military professionals, um, as army professionals in specific, is that we have to be ready and we have to provide our senior leaders options um, in order to work with our allies and partners to make sure that there's security, prosperity, and stability uh, when and where it's needed. And so this is absolutely a group effort, but we have to be ready for the job that's requested of us. Um, the other thing I would say, and, and really pulling on, on Emma's point, is that, you know, uh, um, Nadia, we, we tried to make this very clear, you know, with the document that was for the, the U.S., is that countries have choices, and they get to choose whether or not to be an adversary. And all of our guidance documents from the national security strategy all the way down to the army strategy has said that you know, we want to work with other countries when we have common interests. Um, and I would say, you know, when we're looking at our, our shared professions with those from other places around the world, uh, we we do have things that, that work together, uh, you know, pulling on what, what Mike had said, that uh, you know, there are always times when you're having competition and, and cooperation, but being clear-eyed about what you're pursuing. Um, you know, but we don't think, at least from, from our part of the Army, that we are, you know, inevitable in this, in this effort. Um, so when we're looking specifically at the Army, and, and I think one of the reasons why the Army Futures Command was even stood up was that you know, our approach to get to this point, specifically in the Army, was, was really having a lot of problems. And we would come up with a good idea, and 35 years later, we would pop out a good widget. Um, and I'm exaggerating that a little bit, but we had to be able to get uh, better through the process of having an idea and getting that capability to the warfighter so that we would have uh, more ability to to do what we required on the on on the battlefield and outside of the battlefield. So General Murray has asked us to look at 2035. For some people, that may seem like forever. Um, I know Pat, you asked us to say kind of the, the four years out, but there's a host of reasons why we're trying to look that far out. And part of it is is that you know we have some intelligence of understanding what's going to be out that far based off trends, based off of where states probably could be. Um, we have technology that we're already working on right now as far as you know within the the basic and, and advanced research um we also know things and, and again pulling with mike the ai autonomy and robotics when you combine them together we just had an exercise that was at yuma a couple of months ago um being able to pull things out of a lab where we're able to connect things um and how how could that be used on the battlefield uh, we want to make sure that we understand these challenges, we understand so that we aren't having fair fights, um, but that we're also applying this in a, a very ethical way because at the core we're still Americans. Um, and so I would say that as we're looking through the, the competition, um, and yes, of course, we want to avoid conflict, but we also realize kind of at our core that this is so much bigger than just a military challenge, and especially how we're being pressed. We're being pressed in ways that, that it really often is, is a lagging military challenge. But from an Army perspective, we need to make sure that when we have discussions across the Department of Defense and when we have discussions across the interagency and we have discussions with allies and partners and industry and communities, that we in the Army understand how to contribute to that. And so that's the role that we're trying to look at. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, is as we're looking forward, we're also trying to make sure that we're not forgetting the recent history. And so, again, we're looking out 15 years, but if you did the flip, and I think this is going... Uh, with what Nadia talked about as far as the U.S. being on a holiday from history, a lot has changed in the past 15 years, but a lot hasn't. And as we're looking forward and we're looking at some of these different countries, um, how fast have they changed and how much have they changed? And that's part of what we're looking forward to the future. So when we look back at, at 2005 at North Korea, a lot of leaders changed. A lot of situations have changed. You know, some technology has has gotten a little better, but it's not fundamentally a, a really core different issue that we're still wrestling with. And it's still a lot of really bad options. So when we look at China, and again, pulling on comments from the others on the panel, is that they were just starting in the WTO, you know, four years into it. You know, 
the, the, the challenges that China placed on our country and our allies and partners and those especially in the region are fundamentally different. And so I think as we're looking forward to 2035, we're also trying to understand you know, what's capable, what's possible, but then also from the, the US perspective of what could be. And so kind of the, the closing of it is that as we're looking to, to 2035, um, we, we absolutely do expect there's gonna be changes to the international system. We expect there's gonna be changes to the, the character of warfare, including based off of some of these technologies and, and their ability to work together. Um, and we have to be able to change about how we're able to prepare to operate. Um, and I think exactly to, to Mike's point is that we, we can't just be risk averse because it's not just us that's changing. However, I would say that our ability to, you know, pulling on your title to impose costs and disrupt those who may wish us harm, um, they're gonna have many similarities too. First and foremost, our allies and partners are a tremendous strength of our country. And it's not just us that are having challenges. Um, and the second one is that countries can't move their neighborhoods. So we are very blessed as a country to have two very large oceans. Um, however, other countries can't say, you know, I don't, I don't like this, so therefore I'm moving. On the flip side, you know, countries that uh, um, uh, are causing some challenges to the United States are also causing challenges to their neighbors. And I think we have to make sure this is not just the U.S. interest. There are many. Um, a third one is that policymakers, when it comes to people that are in the military, still want options. And so we have to make sure that there's there's a, a span of things that we can do um, so that we can, if, if possible, uh, avoid war, um, but making sure that we're able to, to keep our national security interests moving forward. Um, I would say that it's rarely in our interest to push adversaries together. Um, and so as we're thinking through these plans in 2035, it will not be in our interest to try to uh, take on everybody at the same time. And so how are we working through these challenges so that the four countries you talked about today don't become their own alliance. And again, not that they would, but that's something we have to think through. Um, and, and going, I think, Emma, to your point, is that it's much easier to deter than to coerce or defeat after. And so what are those things that, you know, the military is one small slice. We should be helping. We are helping. But how are we able to help in this way? Um, and then I think the last part is, is that, you know, if we have a highly determined foe that wants to do something, that's very challenging. Um, but they still need their people's support. And so I think, you know, as we're working through this, you know, in 2035, there are still people and there are still states pulling on what, what Nadia said. They're really having a decisive impact on with what's happened. So, so I guess the final concluding, we in the Army, are, we see ourselves as one part of the solution, um, how we in the Army and how we as Americans are approaching this problem. Um, but really to be successful, this has to be an all-inclusive endeavor. And we just, we really appreciate the insights that we're able to be drawn from, from this panel. And I look forward to some additional ones to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, sorry, you locked up for a second. Uh, thanks for your comments. And as you were talking, as you uh, the challenges that you face at Army Futures Command, as you're trying to figure out, you know, to paraphrase you, what widget to buy for 2035, maybe think of Mike's comments on uh, the importance of if we had better ability to forecast, maybe you'd, making, you'd be making more educated wild ass guesses, excuse my language. All right, so we're at this time we're about, uh, we have about 30 minutes until the end of the panel. And so what we're gonna do first for the first phase is I am gonna ask a, a series of questions for the panelists and we'll do that for about a 10 or 15 minutes. And then we'll do open mic night uh, for, for everyone who's still, uh, who's still dialed in. Now, the first question is going to sound like it's geared toward two people in particular, because it is, but I, I'd be, I love the value of, of outside perspectives. So this is a question for everyone, though it's going to be addressed to the two people that, were, uh, that wrote the National Security Strategy. You know, as the foundational strategic document for the United States, it sets the tone that other strategic documents flow, flow out of it. So from 17, we had the NSS, and a year later with the NDS, uh, and that set the grounds for the 2018 NDS, where General Ma or Secretary Mass was very explicit on the four plus one threats. Um, but wor words are nice. Uh, more importantly, is do they do words result in action that that has effects? Um, so for the panel, and we'll go back. Uh, and we'll go back to alphabetical order. So Stephanie, will be back to you first. How do you think? How effective has the 2017 NSS been? And when I say it, I'm also wrapping up. It's it's the follow on strategic documents. Or is it just a bunch of good words? Over. 
Um, <laughs> so I, I would say that to me, the, and again, I, I feel like Nadia should go first because she was really kind of the core of what the effort was working with General McMaster. Um, to me, it helped change the conversation in a way that it would have been impossible for the United States to have a coherent discussion um, without having that document come out. Um, to me, what was so interesting was is that as we were wrestling with, with the challenges in the, the fall of 2017, when I was able to join Nadia's team, was that so many people across so many industries and academia and economist articles were coming out. Um, but until the US government was able to, to call out this challenge, um, it was really hard to, to wrestle with it. I would say that from an army perspective, so I'll come into where I'm at now, is that, you know, obviously um, the, the invasion of Russia into Crimea and to, to Donbass in 2014 was, was altering um, for a lot of people, but it was really impactful for us. But I think the, the efforts that came from the national security strategy, from the national defense strategy, that we have to be taking a systematic approach across both of these uh, competitors who are stressing us in very different ways. Um, even from an army perspective that, you know, we often don't think that the army has a big role in the Indo-Pacific, even though most of the countries have uh, very, very strong armies. Um, it, it's helped us focus in a way that we simply were not able to um, coming off of, of the challenges that we've had in the Middle East. So from the inside of, of this effort, and I think pulling on Mike's point that, you know, whatever the election, however it ends up rolling out, um, it's hard to see the, the army and the military being asked to, to, to do something other than focus on this. Um, from the inside, it absolutely, like every day I feel and I'm focused on the challenges that, that documents were outlining. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. I'll, um, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll build on, on Stephanie's points. Um, it absolutely has changed things in very specific areas. So, um, you know, not surprisingly, I agree with Stephanie, it changed the conversation. Another way of putting that is it diagnosed a problem, a problem which most Americans agreed with, most in the policy community agreed with, and it created a sense of shared responsibility across departments and agencies and the American public and some of the private sector to do something about it. So I've argued in, in other fora that we have a multi-domain competitive strategy in play. And I can go through the whole list and give specifics, but I won't, but I'll identify the four categories and, and separately happy to expand on them. On the political side, we created a different set of balancing coalitions. The Indo-Pacific is a meaningful concept which has changed relationships in the region. There is unprecedented cooperation among the Quad, Quad plus countries, the nature of the US-Japan alliance, the nature of what Japan itself is doing. It's a completely different situation and it's concrete. Um, Europe, Europe as well, although you know it's hard, it's very hard to see through the noise in terms of what's happening in Europe, the kind of cooperation uh, among Europeans, uh, the EU calling China a systemic rival. I can go through you know, the changes, a lot of the tech cooperation issues that Mike has been working on. So these are these are different political coalitions. Second, we have definitely taken steps to shape the military balance of power to deter I mean, uh, fun funding for missile defense. That's directly related to the problem sets we're talking about. New operational concepts that DOD and the Joint Staff are working on directly related. Uh, uh, you know, freedom of nav navigation operations, um, you, know, you know, I mean, all, all of the, you know, the, the, I mean, there's, sure, there are disagreements about sort of the, the tech, the existing platforms, Chris Bros's book and the kill chain versus existing platforms. But these, these predated, you know, the current administration, these are ongoing problem sets that are not going to go away. Third, stopping the exploitation of the liberal international order. So I would actually respectfully, um, you know, uh, uh, disagree um, with, um, you know, uh, disagree with the comments that it's just, you know, about competition to what end? 
competition to stop the exploitation of the liberal international order. So people have disagreed with some of the means of doing that, but certainly CFIUS, preventing, preventing investments in strategically important countries, completely strengthening that, calling out IP theft, uh, demanding that Chinese companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange abide by the same rules as American companies. I mean, I can go over the list of, of specific activities. And then third, the more proactive elements of maintaining and prevailing in tech and innovation. And those have been probably more statements. These are areas where there have been a lot of executive orders about, about these. Now the question is, is the funding going to follow and is the appropriate mechanisms going to follow? And they're big debates. Again, some of the panelists know more than I, including Mike, not, not to call them out too much about what's the best way to channel that funding. Uh, how do you do that? But this is more of the what do you need to do domestically to prevail? So there are four key categories of activities and there has been change and development. It's just never covered. <laughs> so and, um, you know, and I can point to a bunch of good articles, I think, uh, you know, uh, recently and happy to, if there's a follow up email list, uh, send those to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Mike or Emma, um, any thoughts on an outsider's yeah. view? Sure. Yeah, I'll I'll hop in here. Um, so, so I 100% agree. I think that the, the national security strategy changed the narrative. Um, we we are talking about these issues. The debate has just completely changed from where it was four years ago. Um, I, I would dispute a little. I, I think there have been some concrete changes made. Um, I think perhaps that change has not been as comprehensive as, as one might say. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the national security strategy promises that we'll pivot towards great power competition. We'll move away from transnational threats like counterterrorism. Uh, you know, it, it says we'll, st we'll still deal with those, but it, it says we'll pivot away. Um, on the ground, that has not actually been the case. Um, there's still substantive U.S. deployments overseas engaged in, in counterterrorism. Those numbers have actually dialed up in, in recent years. Um, and perhaps some of that is the, the kind of incoherence in implementation that we've seen across this administration. And perhaps, you know, if, as, as Michael suggests, we have some continuity uh, in concepts into, into a, if we have a Biden administration, it might be more coherent. Um, I, I think there's also been some ways where the strategy has, uh, at least in practice, sort of pushed um, against itself. Uh, in different ways. So, for example, um, how we're pursuing, you know, confrontation and competition with um, with Iran and China, uh, we have seen those two issues come into uh, conflict in our relationship with Europe. Right. So that the Europeans would probably be more on board with our approach to China if we weren't taking such a hard line on Iran. So I, I do think the narrative has changed, but I'm not sure that that it's been quite as coherent in its implementation as, as you might have liked to have seen. Thank you. I, I guess I, I would only add just very, very briefly, since I, I actually agree with a lot of what my colleagues have said, that the I think a challenge. I think a. I think a big I mean, accomplishments the wrong way to, to say this in some ways, you know, the US, if you're going to be the world's leading power, you're going to face a lot of different kinds of challenges that require different sorts of capabilities and that where you need to change how you prior, you know, what the what the mix looks like over time, both in terms of emphasis of effort. Uh, uh, diplomatically and emphasis of effort, you know, militarily. And, and one of the things that I think the, the national security strategy did was, even though I think M is right that the U.S. has still been engaged in plenty of that sort of activity during the Trump administration, but that changing the conversation to focus on these on great power competition after uh, essentially, you know, 15 years of, you know, all coin all the time, um, which is obviously I'm exaggerating, just to be clear what I'm saying that, but the the like anybody that looks at budgets would be like, no, it wasn't. But the the that's a change in a, a, that change in emphasis, I think, helped recenter strategic thinking towards the Indo-Pacific in, in a way that I, I think is important. And that even if we do see a change in in a, even if Biden wins and we do see a change in, in American strategy toward the Indo-Pacific, I think the Indo-Pacific will still remain you know, a, a huge strategic fulcrum. And remember, it took 15 years to get to where we are today. It took 15 years for us to get to a situation where, you know, some of our most sensitive technologies, companies, DOD are, are, is, are so vulnerable, you know, don't even want to go into it. 
So it is going to take time to shift to a way where we can regain ground. And, and strategies have to have, they have defensive and offense components. And part of a defensive component is to stop the hemorrhaging, to stop you know, our losses, which we're incurring in certain areas, and, and to rebuild and look forward. I mean, it's a dialectic, it's a balance. It, but it took a, you know, it took a long time to get to where we were in, uh, you know, 2017, and it's going to take some time to readjust. Over. Thanks, Nadia. All right, um, I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pose uh, two short questions. And you can in the panel, you can pick whatever one you want to pick from, and this will be short, more of a shorter answer because I see we've already have two hands raised for people that want to chime in. So I'll pose two questions. Uh, your, your pick on what your answer is, what opportunity do you think that we have missed? Or, uh, Mike, based, based on the point you made, if you had to prioritize, what would be the one thing that you would say the U.S. should put in order? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of things we've got to fix, but if you, if you had to put a priority, what would be the top one and why? So what's an opportunity that you think that we've missed that we, we should have, if, uh, we could have acted better on? Or what part of the U.S. House should we bring in order first? for whoever wants to take the first one. Sure, I, I, I can jump in. Uh, let me start actually by very quickly saying something that I think people hearing from me, this, this might not be what you would expect me to say, but uh, let, let, me, let, me, uh, let me compliment the Trump administration. I, in, uh, the more I've thought about it, I think, the, the, the fo I think Space Force might not be a bad idea, short version. Uh, just in that, if you think that like it's easy to make fun of, sure, but all of the research we have on military innovation, like all of it, and military history suggests that if you want to take uh, something like this seriously, you need an organization whose job it is to take it seriously. And as long as space was under the Air Force, it was never going to be the top priority for very good reasons. It wasn't the top priority of the Air Force. It never would be the top priority of the Air Force. Splitting space, if, if space is genuinely that big a priority, splitting it off, not a crazy idea. That now, like the naming, the branding, the implementation, the funny logo, like okay. But there, you know, the I actually think the more that I've thought about it, the more like I've come around a little bit on that. Not that I was like that opposed to begin with. Um, okay, what could be better? Uh, I will not say something anything about technology here because I think that that um, obviously I think the U.S. needs to be investing more uh, in a lot of emerging technologies and making more bets. Like the gap between senior leader rhetoric and reality and investments on the ground is very large. Uh, I mean, I, I think this. I think there are our, our domestic leading is the place where we need to focus. If you look, you know, if you if you do a post mortem, if you want a pre mortem sort of China ruling the world in 2040, I think the it's unlikely to be because China invented some widget that you know magically defeated the American military. It's going to be more likely that internal divisions in American society and you know varieties of trouble mean that America can't uh, achieve its potential anymore. And that uh, becomes a, a struggle, uh, you know, growing struggle for the United States that causes the United States to turn more away from the world and seed and global leadership. So I think in some ways that's the P. I mean, we all know it's there, but it's really hard to address. And the challenge is that it's hard to, it's not necessarily a military thing to address. All right, thank you. Anyone else want to take a swag? I think one opportunity, I think one consistent um, opportunity that we miss that we have trouble with overall and have for years is reaching out directly to, you know, the populations of a lot of these uh, problematic countries. And we just have a terrible, we don't really have the apparatus to do that. And the platforms are not owned by the U.S. government to do that. And then the platforms are often blocked by, by countries. So it, it's a tough problem. I don't know uh, the answer to it, but um, but I think we're persist we're consistently weak in that area, and it's too bad because it's um it's it's very low cost, <laughs> and it's it's like a concrete implementation of soft power, and it's just we we found it hard. So thanks, Nani. It sounds like a a uh, an argument for bring for the old USIA, which which did the radio free insert country. Uh, Steph or Emma. Yeah, at, at the risk of, of saying something that's been said so much the last year or two, um, the, the thing that the U.S. really needs to put in order is to rebuild uh, our capacity in the non-military space. 
and again, I know this is a military audience, but um, you know, the State Department is not in a good shape. Our, our development organizations are not in good shape. Um, and to drill down even further into it, it's not so much that the organizations themselves are, are in a bad place as they have basically become completely incapable of recruiting and keeping the, the young, dedicated workforce that they actually need to do their work. And a lot of these things that we're talking about, particularly Nadia talking about soft power and, and how we can appeal to other countries' populations, um, we need the, the infrastructure to do that. We don't currently have it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, got a quick one or uh, can I flip over to the questions that we have. We have a couple, of, we have three raised hands now, a record. I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. Um, so pulling on what Mike had talked about being, uh, making sure that we're not risk averse. And one of the things General Murray has told us is as we're looking at the concepts, to be hard linked with the scientists so that not, we're not creating fantasy, but we're actually pushing things forward about what could be. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, is an American citizen. So I also think the strength of America is not our government and it's not our military, it's our people. And so, you know, we are a very split country right now, but we have an engaged American electorate right now. And so how do we make sure that if we're going to be successful in this going forward, we have this dialogue with Americans who at the end of the day live in a very, very huge country, um, but it's still our country and it's our people. So I think that's just something that, you know, as we move forward to making sure that um, we're, we're explaining these things and talking with people about what our future could be. All right, thank you, Stephanie. All right, at this point, we have uh, we have just under 15 minutes until we wrap this up. I've got three hands that are raised, and in order, it's going to be Liam Collins will be first, followed by someone who has the initials MB, and then it'll be Cynthia Roberts. So, uh, Liam, over to you. All right. Hey, hopefully you can hear me. Hey, uh, this is a much better conference than the ones MWI's had in the past. I know, you know, I can say it's it, it's definitely an improvement on, on where things used to be. But uh, hey, yeah, so our defense budget, right, dwarfs our competitors. And yet, as discussed today, they, they're able to maintain a number of advantages vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. In, in, you know, in many areas. So given what was discussed today, where is the military overinvested and where are we underinvested, right? I, I agree with Emma, right? It'd be nice if we can give more money to state or other, other areas where we need to make a larger investment. But assuming, right, we're not going to have massive changes on any of that. Where specifically kind of within the military, where do we kind of have it, you know, wrong in terms of, right, what are we not investing in enough and, and, and what do we need to kind of purge from or scale back? So I, I don't know, maybe Stephanie or whoever, but, uh, you know, one or looking for an answer from someone. Here, I'll make my emerging tech plug here and say the, the you know, it, I think the, I don't think it's anything in particular. I think it's the flaw in our acquisition system where it takes us 30 years to buy something and it, and buying it means buying like all of it all at once. Like I'm looking at you F35 program and the, 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 the challenge is that then by the time you, you, you're rolling out the platform, you already have to make changes because a bunch of the tech is obsolete. If we think that we're in a fast, a world of fast moving technological change, even though power will come from the way our organizations seek to use that technology and our people and the way they work with the technology, it's not about the like gadgets themselves. The, it means we need to be thinking about more about uh, what sort of what we used to like used to used to do like early Cold War, even World War II, like faster production, you know, smaller production runs, doing uh, flattening essentially experimentation. Uh, looking for new concepts of operation and fielding in a way that means, you know, it's maybe not the most efficient way to do things. It's more efficient to just do like one big buy of F-35s. But if, if that's not going to be optimal for creating the, the force we need to, to fight and win in, you know, 2030, 2040, then I think it, the, the, the change has to be in the system rather than like a one particular thing. Next, uh, next up is guest is MB. I don't know your name, it just has the initials. Hi, it's Max Brooks, um, one of the fellows at the MWI, and I have the t-shirt to prove it. Hey, Max, uh, good to see you. Hey, 
My question is something that's been alluded to, spoken about, is that in great power competition implies wholeness of government, right? Wholeness of nation, all in. And it seems like the four countries that we've been discussing, they get it and their populations get it. But as a civilian, I was told since 9-11 that my only contribution to my own defense was to pray, hug my kid and buy stuff. And that's it. And clearly that sheep and sheepdog model is not going to work anymore. So my question to this panel, to the panels that came before us, to everybody listening is, what ideas do we have, do you have, to help me and you introduce ourselves to each other? Max, great question. I'm going to see, uh, we're going to See who steps on the mic first. I mean, I think, I, you know, I, I think it's also who. So there's there. Uh, civil, I mean, there's a big discussion in this country and always has been about national service, right? So you have civilians who are working in all different sectors in the private sector, opportunities for national service. Um, but I think the area that I focused on more is other non-military U.S. government institutions and agencies um, and why I think the, the, the concept of competition is so important is because they do not think competitively. The Department of Commerce uh, does not traditionally think competitively about, um, you know, in, in the same way that the military and IC does or for that matter, the State Department. So I do think there need to be cultural shifts in, in these other agencies and organizations. I like the term shared responsibility better than whole of government. Whole of government, uh, of course, we need all different parts of our government working together uh, to, to address common problems and opportunities, but we spend an awful lot of time uh, sitting around uh, in thinking about how we have to organize ourselves and work together and create these crazy flow charts. And, and so uh, I'm kind of moving away from that process and thinking about how do you get specific departments and agencies to have a concept of shared responsibility and to do what they do best and, and to go and execute, um, right? There's, you can spend forever working to coordinate and that really slows our government down. So we might need some better concepts. And I really so think, a, yeah, I'll, oh, over. Sorry. Events just like this are, are critical steps. It's not somebody else's responsibility. It's how are we able to have people with different ideas connecting with people who can make a difference? And that difference is is from the individual level up through the state level and, and above. And so I think uh, speaking in clear English is always helpful. And I think that was one of the things that Nadia was so adamant is that you know if my extended family in Missouri couldn't read a sentence, mm -hmm. we needed to re re rewrite it. And not my extended family in Missouri was going to read anything that I wrote because it's not that interesting to them. Um, but being able to have that, and I think again from the academic side is that you know there are some things that just really matter within the academic community, but but often I don't have as much time to read 30 page papers. I just, I don't, I do, but I don't have as much time to read those. And so I think trying to find ways like this of people that are able to translate across, having people come in and serve, having also people just go out and help their community. I think this is, this is our challenge. And I think we won't succeed as a country unless we all feel part of the solution. Just to add to that, I, I do think there's there's kind of been an assumption in, in Washington for the last four years that, that we have to, persuade the American people of the value of our foreign policy approach. That somehow the problem is that people just don't understand how important it is that we do this in foreign policy. And if you look at a lot of the polling, it shows that Americans mostly want to stay engaged globally, um, but that there are some fairly strong undercurrents of people saying, well, we shouldn't be the world's policemen. Um, there's some very strong undercurrents on, on trade and globalization. Um, and we are sitting here, we don't have a winner in this election yet. And that is to some extent a vindication of some of the ideas that Donald Trump has been arguing for for four years and that some of his base continue to share, which is that this is not the approach. You know, we should not be getting involved in great power competition. This should not be wars that we're always fighting overseas. And so, um, you know, I think we we have 
conversations about the ways that we can persuade the U.S. population that it's that it's right. But we need to we really need to consider the, the flip side of the coin, which is that the, the voters may end up having more of a veto here. We may end up seeing more politicians like Donald Trump making the exact opposite argument. Um, and I know this gets a little complicated because the obviously the national security apparatus put out different strategies than he himself has, has talked about. Thanks. All right, we have about uh, we've about five minutes left. So the next question is going to be from Cynthia Roberts. And if that's uh, done, if it's a short enough question, we'll go to I apologize for mispronouncing her name, Vivek Thangam from uh, Features Command. So Cynthia, over to you. Thank you. I, I want to say how much I actually enjoyed the MWI conference and um, grateful to them. I participated on the Russia panel and I thought the questions were challenging. Uh, it's hard to think about imposing costs on rivals, um, although I think it's a useful exercise. But, you know, we we came up with some ideas that reflected on how imposing costs on rivals is not a bad idea if it actually weakens the ability of our rivals to harm us or our allies and partners, um, but also that it can support deterrence as much as it may be even better than coercion. And we don't want to lose sight of the fact that um, deterrence is cheaper and easier uh, and where it can do that. And uh, in the area I was talking about on nuclear deterrence, we have a whole history of doing that effectively, imposing costs first on the Soviet Union and now on Russia that support deterrence. Uh, and that's desirable because it helps avoid war and it doesn't eliminate the opportunities for strategic stability talks in arms control and so on. But my question is actually much harder than the one asked here, and that's uh, how we manage to be careful in imposing costs on rivals, which can be a desirable goal, without imposing additional costs on us, or as Robert Work put it, without allowing our adversaries to beat us at our own game. And working on the other side of U.S. power, the, uh, the sort of monetary and financial pow uh, power of the U.S., the dominance of the dollar, this is to me very worrisome because uh, I'm not sure we're good at identifying um, where we still need to stay engaged with our rivals. You know, how far we want to go in decoupling. Obviously, we want to decouple in areas that uh, the Chinese are stealing technology or that give them advantage in military sectors like through CFIUS and so on. All of this are, is effective, important, useful for great power competition, which is the norm in international relations. But I go to a lot of uh, market and uh, financial and economic conferences and the private sector doesn't want to be totally decoupled from the only growth market in the world. And neither do uh, those in uh, our, our uh, allied countries, our partners. And so I think we need to do a much better job at answering that question. It's fine to say, yes, we're going to cooperate on climate change and health. Those are the easy ones. But where we draw the line, you know, for example, the academic sector, we don't want to cut out all the Chinese. We want to cut out, you know, their defense people, their spies. Uh, but does that mean every engineer? I mean, we need to think harder about this and find room for engagement that is rewarding to the United States for the goals that Emma Ashford identified, prosperity, uh, security, uh, that requires that other side. And I think we haven't done a good job there yet. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I would think it's really hard about the discussion that we're having now that we weren't having five years ago. So we had PLA, uh, individuals masquerading as students working in our labs funded by our government stealing uh, stealing important technology that could potentially hurt many of the military officers on this call. So it's not easy, but we're having conversations now as a country with university administrators. Mike's right in the middle of this, so it, it's a tough problem, but we weren't having that conversation five years ago. So, so I think we'll get to the right balance, um, but uh, and, and second, on the decoupling issue, I would point out that 
China itself is driving decoupling, right? They're they're not letting certain applications. They have created a separate internet for their citizens. They have ensured that they control sort of the means of production up up a chain, everything from rare earth minerals all the way up to the microelectronics needed to produce certain systems. So that's a form of actually not really interdependence, right? That's a form of actually ensuring that they control exactly what they need to control. So I think there will be a difference between manufacturing of clothing and manufacturing of software, but I, I, I think the private sector will sort of figure that out itself. There are very few software companies that are going to feel, um, you know, like everything's going to be just fine doing business the way they used to, or at least probably I wouldn't invest in those companies. But so I think it'll, it'll defer, it'll depend on the businesses. Pat, just quickly, um, I think one of the things is, is that when we're imposing costs, that's a relative term. And if we're able to help strengthen our allies and partners, that that is also imposing costs in a positive way. Um, and so allowing, helping other countries be able to, to thwart interference in their own countries is, is imposing costs on potential adversaries and, and competitors that, that we are and we should be doing. So I, I just, I don't, I agree if it's on cost and you're thinking economically, like we are suffering, but, but I, I would encourage like, how do we strengthen others so that it's where everyone that is working against the competitor is doing better. Stephanie, great point. And uh, I see a few more hands, but I think we could probably go all night. I'm looking at the time we've, we've hit our, hit our, uh, hit our end time. So to all the panelists, I, I truly appreciate the time and the thought you've given today. Uh, and to, to, to pick that gloomy, gloomy story that I used before with, with Mike, hopefully hard thinking like this will keep us, will help us innovate and change before we get that punch in the nose that will be too painful. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Max, our research director. So again, to the panel, I truly thank you for your time uh, and your thoughts tonight. Max, over to you. Thanks a lot. Right. Thanks, Pat. Um, Vivek and Leaf, I'm sorry that uh, that we're not going to get to your questions, but I would definitely encourage you to shoot them over to me, shoot them into the chat, and I'm sure that everybody will be happy to continue engaging uh, by email, over Twitter, whatever other ways we like to continue these conversations. Um, I know it's definitely dark out here now, um, and it's been a long day. I really appreciate um, all of the audience, all the panelists. Um, I know I've been looking forward to either meeting or re-engaging with with some of you in various capacities um and so i'm really sorry that we couldn't do it more in person um but i am really grateful that you shared your expertise and experience with everybody here today um so with that everybody have a great night keep your eye out um on for uh mwi's website for some you know future uh after action reports about the conference and um yeah hope to see you guys soon good night Thanks, Matt. Well done.